Welcome to the podcast of New Story Church in downtown Los Angeles. We pray that this message inspires you to be the church wherever you are. For more information about our community of faith, check out newstorychurch.com. We hope you'll enjoy the message. Amen. Good morning, New Story Church. So good to see you guys. Uh, Welcome to part three of the Gospel and Sexuality series. I'm Pastor Tom, in case we haven't met yet, uh, especially for those of you watching online, we want to welcome you all, uh, as well as those of you IRL, in real life. Is that what the kids say these days? I don't know. I'm going to get in trouble for that. But anyways, my my girls are always correcting me. Dad, you shouldn't have said that. Anyways, uh, today we have the privilege of hosting uh, an incredible guest speaker and a fast friend of mine, Pastor Tony Scarcello, or if you uh, have any Italian friends, you know that it's Antonio Scarcello, but uh, Tony is an author, an author, a pastor, a speaker, a bookworm, and a self-described pitiful golfer, just like Pastor David, I guess. Anyways, no, no, uh, after... Yeah, Pastor David doesn't describe himself that way, but anyways, uh, after over a decade of youth ministry... Uh, Tony and his lovely wife of nine years, Kelsey, have started the process of church planting in Springfield, Oregon. So Oregon is in the house. We know that you're watching online. Let's give it up for them as well. So good, so good. Tony is also the author of Regenerate, Following Jesus After Deconstruction. And you published this, actually. This was published before deconstruction was such a popular word, right? So I just, I love that. Uh, You also need to know that Tony shares with us uh, this position that, that I've been calling sort of the messy middle or the radical middle, uh, especially in terms of uh, a view of sexuality as it relates to same-sex attraction and activity. Now, we spent uh, the greater part of the past two weeks discussing that, but just quick summary. Uh, you have, uh, you know, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving, Christ-following Christians uh, that, that come from a school of thought that believe, you know, the attraction and the action, it's all sinful. Uh, and that the only course correction is that uh, God cures and that the orientation is actually changed. And that is definitely one end of the spectrum that good, God-believing, Christ-following people uh, believe. Uh, over here on the other end of the same exact spectrum uh, would be instead of sinful, it's all beautiful. Right? Uh, especially within the context of a mutual monogamous relationship. And, and folks on this side would say that God actually blesses that and that one of the choices that you're offered there is marriage. Now, those are the two extremes of the spectrum. Uh, like I said, we happen to hold to a messy middle, as it were. I, I call it a messy middle because it's kind of easy to go black or white in all things, right? To be polar one way or another. Uh, uh, Any time that you gravitate towards the middle, it's going to be a little messier by nature. Uh, grays are a little messier by nature. And we don't apologize for that. We acknowledge that. We accept that. We almost, in, in some sense, we welcome it because there we find... That, yeah, with same-sex attraction, not sinful, right? Another word for it might be temptations. Uh, Scripture says that Jesus himself was tempted, yet without sin. Uh, But with many of these temptations uh, comes options. Uh, There come choices, uh, and that if you were to exercise certain options and, and move towards action, well, then yes, then we're talking about lines are drawn, and then we're talking about uh, sinfulness. Uh, we believe here in the messy middle that in that process, in that dynamic that I just described, you know what? God, through his word, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the, the help of the community of God, the church, uh, he empowers, and that one One of the options from that, as we heard last week, personal testimony, uh, would be uh, to choose a celibate life, right? So that kind of gives you a little bit of the paradigm there, a little bit of of uh, of the spectrum there. And today, our speaker shares that same uh, messy middle territory, as it were. Uh, If you haven't uh, caught up on those messages yet, or today is your first day, great, love that you're here, uh, but make sure to do yourself a favor uh, and check out those first two messages uh, from this series uh, afterwards. Having said that, 
Uh, Tony Scarcello is a friend of ours. He's a, a fellow brother, and let's give him a big new story family welcome as he shares God's word. How's everybody doing? Good. Last week, you guys got to hear from uh, one of my heroes and a very dear friend of mine, Greg Coles. How was that for you guys? Is that awesome? Yeah. <clears throat> Let's give it up for Greg Coles. That's, yeah, this is not going to be that good. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a cruel and unusual prank to make me follow up uh, Dr. Greg Coles. It's like last week you got like a filet mignon cooked to perfection with like asparagus and buttery garlic mashed potatoes and homemade rolls. And this week you're getting a happy meal. And uh, so, but you know, like God spoke through many great prophets in the Old Testament and he spoke through a donkey once. And so last week was like the great prophet Isaiah and this week is donkey time. So I hope you're ready. Um, like Pastor Tom said, uh, my name's Tony. I'm a pastor. I'm a church planter. Um, if you want to throw that picture back up there, I've been married to this lady for almost eight years this year. Uh, she's the girl of my dreams. Uh, you can throw the next picture over. Here's us a little bit older, a little bit fatter, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit with some years on us. And, um, yeah, Kelsey is beautiful and sweet and resilient. You have to be resilient to be married to me. Um, this year, we actually uh, lost her mother to COVID. Um, her mom had an autoimmune disorder, and even though she was vaccinated, uh, COVID still got her, and we lost her. And I watched my wife uh, play the role of mom and big sister and maid of honor at her sister's wedding last month and just do it like a total superhero. So she's, she's my hero. She's everything I want to be when I grow up, um, except I, I want to stay a man. But other than that, like she's great. Um, <clears throat> I want to invite you guys to pray. Go ahead and stand up if you're okay with that. We're gonna pray before we dive in. I wanna give you guys a heads up. I'm recovering from a cold. I took two COVID tests. It's not COVID and I'm vaccinated and boosted and had COVID in February. So like, it's, uh, I'm pretty safe to say it's not COVID. But I, if I you know, cough or sniffle a little bit, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I have a bit of a cold. Um, but let's, let's pray. Lord, I, uh, I just love you and your grace and um, just the way that you recycle our broken and painful moments and you turn them into something that makes much of your story, makes much of your love. Lord, I just ask that your spirit would, would come here this morning and you would permeate our hearts and you do something that only you can do. Um, we just invite you here. We love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. I'll go ahead and be seated. I want to ask you to come with me on a journey back to 2004. Back in 2004, this was the year that the sitcom Friends ended. Any Friends fans in the house? I think for a couple of you, Friends is the greatest sitcom of all time. In my opinion, my wife thinks The Office is the greatest sitcom of all time. Are there Office fans in here? Okay, okay, you can go home. It's fine. Like, I, I love Friends. We actually have a dog named Halpert and a cat named Chandler. So, like, we, we, and then, like, as luck would have it, coincidentally, we lost a cat named Chandler and kept the dog named Halpert. So, I think Kelsey got rid of my cat. Anyways, um, that's the year that Friends ended. Uh, it's the year that Ugg boots were introduced into the world, those awful, comfortable shoes. It's the back when Donald Trump firing somebody didn't feel like a national crisis. So it was just something that, that happened on TV. But this was also the year that I realized that I wasn't straight. And this realization felt as though I had received the death penalty on my soul. This realization led to a decade of nearly nonstop anxiety and fear that I would be found out and rejected. You see, the church culture that I grew up in didn't really talk about this stuff. And if it did talk about this stuff, it would talk about it in language that was as dehumanizing and deplorable as possible. And so I grew up, grew up fearing that if anyone ever found this out, I would lose my family, I would lose my church, I would lose my God. And as puberty began its tyrannical reign in my body, and as, as these desires and this, this, these, these longings that I felt inside myself grew more and more intense, I went from being what I thought was a, a pretty sweet and compassionate kid into a violent, angry, drug and alcohol abusing, self-harming teenager. And I begged God for years to take these desires away. I, I spent every single night in prayer asking him to take them away. And for whatever reason, he would not do it. And at a certain point, if you're somebody who has lived with anxiety or depression, you know this to be the case. Living with all of that, that oppressive pain 
it sort of kind of robs you of the will to live. It sort of takes away what the stuff that keeps us up getting in the morning, that keeps us excited about life, that keeps us wanting to be alive. It sort of takes those things away. And I had grown so exhausted by the shame and the hiding and the depression and the self-hatred that in my mind, I only saw three choices. The first is that I could continue to try and live the rest of my life uh, feeling like I was about to explode. I could indulge these desires and leave my faith and my family and face rejections, or I could die. And I believed at the time that shame had so distorted my thinking that I genuinely believed uh, that it would have been better for me to have been dead than to continue to experience these longings or to ever act out on them. And I I actually like convinced myself that my parents would rather see me dead or that God would rather see me dead and see me uh, act out on some of this stuff. So one night when I was 16 years old, I went to my dad's bedroom uh, while my parents were sleeping. I pulled out his revolver and I went into my room and I shut the door and I sat there with the gun in my hand. And I contemplated making an irreversible decision. And obviously, as you can see, as I'm standing before you now, that I didn't make that choice. Um, And we'll get to why in just a moment. But as I got older, I reflected on that visceral pain that I experienced while I was in the closet. And and I had to ask why. Like, why did this realization about myself strike so much pain and fear and agony inside of me? I, I had like I had looked back and I had two amazing parents who raised us in the church who like my parents loved my brother and I so much and they sent us to every camp and retreat possible. And I remember one year in the 2008 recession and my dad had lost his job, my parents literally took out a loan so that my brother and I could still go to church camp. Like they were so committed to seeing like the Lord just like built up strongly inside my brother and I. And I look back at that and I'm like, you know, there were people in my church who when I was growing up, like who, who were like, ex-cons and addicts and they were pa- we had a pastor who was over hurried and he sacrificed his family on the altar of ministry and we had elders who were not so discreetly racist and there were judgmental church ladies and there were greedy people and prideful people and there was room for all types of broken people in our church and they were able they were asked to come and receive redemption and receive grace and to bring their contribution to the family of God and to lead and I would wake up and I would, or I would go to church on Sundays and I would see all these different types of people functioning in this messy way, sewn into the fabric of God's grace, being invited, all types of people except one type of person. And there was no one who openly struggled with same-sex attraction in the church that I attended and any of the churches in my area that I was aware of who was openly able to participate in the life of the church. We rarely talked about this issue growing up. And when we did, yikes. It was almost better if we hadn't talked about it at all. The year I realized that I wasn't straight was also the year that in 2004, a major topic up for debate uh, was the vote to legalize gay marriage nationwide. And in fact, the state of Massachusetts in 2004 became the first state to legalize gay marriage. So there was this ever-growing sense of fear and restlessness restlessness in the church when it came to this topic. So leaders in our church, out of an attempt to try and convince the people in their congregation to vote in a specific way, talked about gay people like they were disgusting. And I had youth leaders in my youth group who talked about how homosexuality was just as bad as pedophilia. And they would say that in some cases it's worse because it's more accepted. All the time they would use these dehumanizing and disparaging language and they didn't realize it, but they were talking about somebody who was sitting in the room an impressionable 14-year-old boy who is forming a worldview in his mind about who he is, who God is, what the world is like, and whether or not there is room for him in it. And I remember growing up in church and thinking, man, it's so much easier for Jesus to love greedy people than it is me. And it's so much easier for Jesus to love cons and addicts and overhurried pastors and racist elders and judgmental church ladies so much easier for him to love them than it is to love me. The Jesus that I grew up with seemed to have room for everybody's stories except mine. But still I prayed 
and I prayed and I begged God for healing. I would go to church camps and retreats and every time there was an altar call, like you know those big emotional altar calls where you come up and you get saved 35 times, like you come up and I would pray and I would just be like, and I would always couch it as like struggling with purity issues, just have them lay hands on me, ask them to heal me and restore me. At one point, after prayer didn't work, I started cutting myself every time I looked at a boy lustfully or fantasized or looked at pornography. Interestingly enough, this self-harm wouldn't happen when I sinned in any other area. It was because, I think, there was a disproportionate amount of focus and a disproportionate amount of shame attached to this one specific area that I viewed it to be worse than any other area of sin in my life. I hated myself so badly. And I look back at who I was as a middle schooler and high schooler. And like, I was a sweet, compassionate, sensitive kid. Like, I, I, there was no reason for that kid to hate himself. I was nice to people. I included people who felt excluded. I had a deep, genuine desire to commit my life to the way of Jesus and to follow him as faithfully as I could. Like, I'd been, I was a youth pastor for 10 years. I would have killed for someone like me in my youth group as a youth pastor. Why did I hate myself so much? I think that part of it, you see, is there's different barriers for people like me in the church than there are for other people. I think that there are just different things put in place based off of cultural circumstances that have made it incredibly difficult to be somebody who experiences a different sexual attraction or who experiences sexual brokenness in a different way than the rest of the world. And it makes it impossible to be honest about that. Not because people are so hateful, not because people mean to be excluding or judgmental, but because the way the cultural culture wars that have gone on around us have swayed the conversation so intensely that we fear that kindness and generosity of spirit and embrace looks like affirmation. And because we don't want to be, we're too afraid of looking like we're affirming, we avoid embracing and loving and showing generosity and kindness towards people. Why do I share all this? I don't share all this because I'm looking for sympathy. I'm not interested in being viewed as a martyr. I'm married, very happily married to a woman. I could just as happily not share any of this at all ever for the rest of my life. Nobody would have to know the difference. So why am I sharing this? You see, I share this because the best things in my life were given to me through the church. My relationship with Jesus, my love for the scriptures, my calling to ministry, my marriage. I met my wife at church. Like the best things in my life were given to me through church. But also so were the worst things in my life. So was the depression and the shame and the suicidality and the self-hatred. Do you know that if I hadn't grown up in church, I probably wouldn't have experienced any of those things over this brokenness inside of me. Do you know that there are people whose lives would be better off if they had never participated in church? How, what do you think that does to the heart of God? When he knows that like this, this community that he established, this, this tribe of people that was meant to be the expression of his love and his generosity, was meant to be a suburb of his kingdom on earth, that there are people who would come to church and who would experience such abuse and shame and hurt that it would have been better if they had never gone in the first place. I don't say this to put guilt or shame on anybody, but it is no longer acceptable for the bride of Christ to sweep her faults and failures under the rug. We've got to adopt a posture of repentance and humility or we will continue to do violence to the witness of Christ on the earth. And this isn't just in regards to LGBTQ people and the way they've been treated in church. If you're aware, the lar- Pastor Tom alluded to it earlier in his prayer today, the largest Christian denomination in the world that was just released that they had unprecedented cover-ups of abuse and scandal and threatening people who came forward to tell the truth and hiring lawyers to sue them and signing non-disclosure agreements and just disgusting evil things that has no place in the body of Christ. 
We've got to take accountability and we've got to repent and we've got to adopt a posture of humility. And I'm not saying when it comes to LGBTQ people that this means that the church needs to take 2,000 years of church history and teaching on the topic of sex and marriage and change it. There are a lot of really well-meaning people who in an attempt to love people well, they think that that means they have to take this ancient sacred union called marriage and redefine what it actually is so that they can include more people and I get that, and, the, and it means well, but I don't think it is actually more loving to encourage somebody to step out of alignment with God's dreams for humanity. I don't think that it's actually doing anybody more good to do that. God created us and our bodies, and he intended them to function in such a way that when we come into alignment with his will, we experience the most peace and flourishing possible. And I don't think God puts the boundaries he does around sex and marriage because he's a cosmic stick of the mud. Sexuality is a powerful, powerful force. People have died for it. They have killed for it. They have killed themselves for it. Wars have literally been started over sexuality. How we steward our sexuality makes a great deal of difference to God because it makes a great deal of difference to us. Sexuality is a gift that has been handed to us from our creator and it is intended to be stewarded well. I like to think of it this way. Sex is like a fire in the woods. If you keep it within the confines of a fire pit, it can provide food and warmth and light and nourishment, but you take it out of the fire pit and what happens? You guys are from California. California wildfires, are no, you're no stranger to those things. I don't think it's more loving to say that we need to just get rid of old boundaries because that's from a different time. We know better now. We don't, that's archaic. We need to move on. We live in a time and space where much of like the cultural belief is that true authority is, is not found in some external source. True authority is not found in God or scripture or a higher ideal. In our time and space, the belief is that true authority is found within ourselves. It's in our desires. Every day we are told that what we desire, what we long for, what what we hope for is the most important thing there is. And if anybody tries to tell you that you can't or you shouldn't, they are either oppressive or repressed. But for most of human history and most belief systems and in most religions, the belief was that as humans, we have a responsibility to take all of these internal longings and desires and feelings and bring them into alignment with the will of an external authority. So as Christians, for us, that means we take all of our internal desires, our wants, our needs, our hopes, our dreams, and we spend the rest of our life working with the power of the Spirit to bring them into alignment with the way of Jesus. But in our day and age, we look to our longings and our desires to guide us rather than looking to Jesus. And that's true for a lot of people in the church. I'm not even just doing cultural commentary on the world outside the church. I'm talking about us. A lot of us are more, if we're being honest, we're more guided by what we want than we are what Jesus wants. In our day and age, it's no longer important. The most important thing isn't to be loving It's not to be just, it's not to be generous, it's not to be kind. The most important thing in our day and age is to be happy and fulfilled. That's the gospel today. We live in a time where it is more important to feel good than to be good. It's what the philosopher Carl Truman calls the modern self. He writes, the modern self assumes the authority of inner feelings It assumes that the most authoritative voice is what's inside of us and that authenticity is the ability to give expression to our inner feelings. So if we're to be fully realized people, we have to always express what's going on inside of us and give expression to those things. The focal point of authority is my inner feelings. It's my wants and my needs and my feelings. And unless I can give expression to those things, it is easy for us to feel that we are being harmed or controlled. And our culture has unquestioningly accepted this narrative. We just bought into it and adopted it and just assumed that it's true. And it, it, it seeps its way into so many different areas. And, and it, it, it's so normal that we don't even think that, like, why wouldn't that be true? But if you look up any stats worth their salt, and they'll show you that this widespread embrace of pleasure as the highest goal has not made us happier or healthier people as a whole. 
Today's generations, even before COVID, but now especially after COVID, well, COVID's still around, but you know what I mean. We have never been more sexually free. We've never been more enlightened. We've never had more opportunities for detached sexual encounters. And even though the sexual revolution won the culture war, we as a people have never been more depressed, more anxious, more addicted, and more prone to deaths of despair than we are right now. And a death of despair is when you die as a result of something that you turn to as some sort of vice. So this is drug overdoses, liver failure from alcoholism, or suicide. If you ask me, the sexual liberation has actually led to sexual bondage for many of us. One of my favorite writers, Stanley Harawas, he says, what we call freedom has become the tyranny of our own desires. We are kept detached, strangers to one another as we go about fulfilling our needs and asserting our rights. What we call freedom is actually slavery to desire. There are people all over asserting that they're free, asserting their rights, asserting that they have everything they need as long as they can just get what they want to feel good. And they walk around totally in bondage, still depressed, still hurting, still alone. I was having lunch with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago uh, who had been a part of the church for a long time and then walked away and we were reconnecting and he was telling me that like he has been going on a ton of Tinder hookups and I'm like, okay, that's different. That's not how you've always been, but that's where you are now. So I wasn't making big stink about it. I was just listening to him and talking to him and I asked him like how he feels when he's done and he said that every single time he's done, he feels just empty and hollow and depressed. He's having the most sex he could ever want And he's still empty and hollow and depressed. So no, I don't think the way to fix what's going on, what's gone wrong, is to throw away 2,000 years of biblical teaching on theology and marriage. I think doing that has only furthered our collective misery. But we do have to reckon with the fact that when it comes to LGBTQ people in the church, the church has not always had the moral high ground. Can we agree on that? That when it comes to queer people in the church, the church has oftentimes lost the right to be heard when it comes to this conversation. In fact, in many ways, what I think some people would call a militant LGBTQ agenda was birthed out of pain and rejection that queer people experienced at the hands of the church. I actually don't think there would even be an LGBTQ community if it wasn't for the church. If from the get-go, when it came to this topics, churches chose love over fear and mercy over judgment... I guarantee you things would look a lot different when it comes to how we navigate this topic. So how do we course correct? We can't go back. We can't change anything. What's been done is done. But we do have a say in what happens now. And we do have a say in how things happen going forward. So first, I want to say that we've come a really long way as Christians in America when it comes to this topic. When I was a kid, it would have been unthinkable to have somebody who struggles with these issues up front talking to people in a church service unthinkable. I get to go and share my story in places, and it's a huge gift. And when I was in high school, if you would have told me that was going to happen, I would have told you that, like, there's no way. What Pastor Tom and the leadership team here at News Story is doing by giving people a, a, a platform to share their story and to open up this topic and to go deep is a huge gift. And it's moving the needle forward to healing a very, very broken bridge in a huge way. Second, I can honestly say that I know very few Christians who are actually blatantly homophobic. I I know a couple, but very few Christians who are actively hateful towards queer people. The more I get to tell my story, the more I get to travel, the majority of the people I meet and I talk to, they're actually people who really want to know how to love LGBTQ people well. And they want to know how to heal the divide. And they want to know how to like fix what's gone wrong. And they want to know how to embrace people who feel rejected by the church without surrendering their biblical convictions. And I think that's the majority of the people in this church and in this room. And that's a beautiful thing. So we're no longer, the conversation is no longer like we got to convince Christians to stop hating LGBTQ people. I think we've moved well past that. I think the majority of Christians do not hate LGBTQ people. And I think Christians get a bad rap when they've done a lot of course correcting. But you see, while there might not be the boundaries that there were, for a while there was boundaries that, that said, these are the limits of our love and you cannot go past these limits. 
We've done a good job at moving those boundaries a little bit and being able to say, hey, actually, no, like the way we handled that was super lame. So let's, let's course correct and let's love more. There's still some tremendous barriers for LGBTQ people in the church. And barriers are kind of, a, they're a lot harder to spot than boundaries. And so to talk about barriers, I want to look to a story in scripture. So if you have your Bibles, uh, Luke chapter 18, we're going to spend some time in Luke chapter 18. And I know it's going to be on the screen, but it's actually more inspired if it's paper. I don't know if you knew that, but I'm just kidding. That's a, that's a stupid joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> chapter 18, starting in verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. And when he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. So one second, I'm going to wait. So I'm not sniffling in your microphone all the time. So Jesus is on Jericho Road. Do you guys know what important, very important gospel story that happens in the gospel of Luke right here that happens before this moment that takes place on Jericho Road? Jesus, just like four or five chapters earlier, told this story called the Good Samaritan. And if you know the story of the Good Samaritan, you know it's the story of about a Jewish man who's walking down Jericho Road, who gets jumped and beat up and left for naked on the side of the road. And religious elite Jewish people were walking by, and even though he was one of their own, they go to the other side of the road and ignore him, and they just walk on by him. And then a Samaritan comes and helps him. Um, so Jesus is, this is an important comparison. He's not on Jericho Road for an accident. Jesus is about to show how he himself is the good Samaritan. He's about to demonstrate the story that he had just told. And on the side of this road, there is this blind beggar, homeless, dirty, disabled. In the ancient world and still today, there is no one more marginalized in society than disabled homeless people. He would have been treated with disdain, he would have been told that there is no place for people like him in the world. And he hears about this Jesus who's coming by. And it goes on, and he says, he called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So I love this because he knows like, he knows something about Jesus. This, he hears the crowd. He hears Jesus of Nazareth is walking by. And he shouts out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Maybe he knew that Jesus was occasionally homeless. And he knew that Jesus was this miracle performing rabbi. And maybe he thought, okay, maybe, maybe because Jesus knows what it's like to be homeless. And he knows what it's like to be pushed aside. Maybe Jesus will come and he will have compassion and mercy on me. And listen to how he addresses Jesus. He's acknowledging that Jesus comes from the line of David, the prophesied Messiah who is going to come and restore Israel back to its former state of glory. And so he's proclaiming his faith in the Messiahship of Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. But look at his request. Isn't it interesting that he isn't saying, Jesus, son of David, heal me. And he's not saying, Jesus, son of David, give me money so I don't have to be homeless anymore. His word here is very, very specific and very, very important. The blind beggar has gone without many things his whole life. But there is one thing that he has gone without more than anything that he wants Jesus to restore in him. Mercy. This word mercy in the Greek comes from the Greek word aleo. And it's a combination of mercy and compassion. This blind beggar is asking for Jesus to stop and notice him. See me, care at all that I exist. It's a well-known fact that the more you have, the more you want as people. Like just the more you have, the more you want. Our sense of longing is always greater than our sense of satisfaction. But when you have nothing... When you have nothing and you've gone your whole life cast aside, dirty, and left out, what you want more than anything is to know that you are noticed and cared for. But mercy is an interesting word here that this man is using because mercy is, isn't just like grace it's, or it's not just like compassion and kindness. It's compassion and kindness mixed with grace. And mercy is something, it's a word that you would use when somebody has done wrong to you and you're choosing to show kindness in response to that wrongdoing. 
So why is this blind man shouting out to Jesus, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me? What has he done to Jesus? What wrong has he done to Jesus? You see, in the ancient world, especially in ancient Israel, it was kind of an honor-shame culture. And the belief was that if you were afflicted with an ailment, they would have taught back in that day that it was God's judgment upon you for some sort of sin that you had done or some sort of sin that your parents had done. There's a story in John chapter nine where Jesus and his disciples see a blind person and the disciples ask, Jesus, who sinned that this person is blind? Was it him or his parents? They believed in that world that if somebody had some type of affliction, that it was God's judgment upon them for sin. Now, I don't know what your guys' view of sovereignty here at New Story is. I'm inclined to believe that God does not cause people like disabilities and ailments as a result of sin. I think that that's more the broken condition of the world and that we live in a world that's held in bondage by sin, death, and the devil. I don't think that God is just like, hey, you did bad, so now I'm going to make you blind. But that was the belief system of the day. So imagine you're this, you're this blind man. You're being told your whole life that the reason you have this ailment is because you're just that messed up of a person. And you're hearing this taught in church or synagogue as you're growing up. And everybody who walks around you and sees you, they know like, okay, he's blind. And I've got some stuff that I've done that's messed up, but God has not made me blind. So that guy must be really messed up for being blind. The shame and the rejection and the pain that he must have experienced. And so he asks for mercy. And when you're that ashamed and that marginalized and that cast aside, can you imagine the courage it must have taken to stand up and draw attention to yourself and ask people not for a handout, not for money, not for pity, but to stand up and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But then what happens next? It says that those who led the way rebuked him. Who's leading the way? Jesus' disciples, his leadership team. Like these people that have been following Jesus and apparently forgot all those teachings about the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Like, they rebuke him and they tell him to shut up and sit down. This is Jesus. This is the Messiah. This is the son of David. He doesn't have time for blind beggars like you. He's got a mission. You are judged by God. You're a blind beggar. You're screwed up. Shut up, sit down and know your place. But I love this. And I love that he says, it says after they rebuked him and after they told him to sit down and be quiet, it says that he shouts all the more. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And it says, then Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. And when he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. And when all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus heals him. And this man becomes one of his followers. And this is one of my favorite stories in the whole Bible because any LGBTQ person who's grown up in the church knows exactly what this blind beggar feels in this story. Knows exactly what it is to feel like God has cursed you with an ailment. Knows exactly what it feels like to be rejected and pushed aside and cast aside and viewed as corrupt and despicable and dirty for something that you had no control over. Something that you never asked for or wanted for yourself. And in the time that this story takes place, this blind man had so many barriers between him and Jesus. First, there's the barrier of bad theology. Growing up in a world that taught him that his blindness was a curse from God because of some sort of sin that he or his family had done. Then there's the barrier of his ailment. He can't see. There's the ailment itself. That itself is a barrier. Then there's the barrier of his culture. There's no compassion on differently abled people back then. There was no welfare programs. There was no trying to find ways so they can contribute to society. They would have been viewed as a burden and nothing else. Why do you think he was homeless? Because nobody wanted to take care of him. But there's one barrier here that to me is by far the saddest of them all. And that's the barrier of Jesus' disciples. They are the biggest barrier 
standing in the way of this blind man and receiving his healing. Once this man musters the courage to say something and begs to be dignified, rather than serving him and loving him and bringing him to the feet of Jesus, what do they do? They rebuke him and they shut him down and they tell him to know his place. And this brings us to our first point. Far too often the church has been the primary barrier between LGBTQ people and Jesus. Far too often. It's really easy to look at the world and think like, well, secularism is the reason that the LGBTQ community is as enticing and strong as it is, or, or bad ideas, or, or movies, or TV, or whatever. And yeah, those all play like a pretty big part in it, but it's not the biggest part as to why the LGBTQ community exists with as much intensity as it does. Andrew Marin wrote a book uh, called Us Versus Them, which I think is really, really important book, and I would encourage everybody to read it. Um, and in this book, he breaks down the largest survey that's ever been conducted between LGBTQ people and their relationship with the church. And they interviewed thousands of queer people, asking them about their relationship with the church. And what they learned in the survey, at least at the time in 2017, was that 86% of LGBTQ people grew up in the church. 86%, and the majority of them left after feeling like they were rejected, shamed, attacked, or abused. We as human beings need community, not want. We need community. We can't live without community. And so what happens when churches all over the country mishandle this issue and reject people because of a very specific brokenness that they experience? And these people are now wandering the streets, oftentimes homeless, oftentimes addicted to drugs, oftentimes selling their bodies so they can get money and pay rent. And they find each other and they create community with each other. And they all now have a common enemy because they all now have one thing that has been used and hurled over them that has been the source of their pain and their abuse and their rejection and their neglect. And it's the church. I think more than TV and movies and secular ideas and college campuses, more than any other thing, the main reason most LGBTQ people won't go to church is because we have spent decades telling them to shut up, be quiet, sit down, and know your place. We've spent decades rebuking them for existing. So here's the good news. This isn't new. Right? Like right out of the gate of Jesus' ministry, we see followers of Jesus making themselves barriers between somebody who needs Jesus and Jesus himself. So I do want to say that, like, because there can be a temptation to say, like, wow, the American church, worst version of the church ever. No, we're fine. Like, we're not fine. We got some messed up stuff. But I'm just saying, this isn't anything new. This isn't like we're not a special type of bad. But here's the better news. And this brings us to our second point. Jesus goes beyond barriers to bring healing to the rejected. So when we fail to bring people to Jesus, when we make ourselves a barrier between somebody and Jesus, he is faithful often to go beyond those barriers and bring healing to people who are rejected. The disciples thought, I'm sure they thought, they were doing Jesus a failure. Sorry, a favor, not a failure. If they, yeah. They, a Freudian slip. <laughs> they thought that they were doing Jesus a favor. They thought Jesus was the Messiah who was forming an army who was going to conquer the Roman Empire. That like he can't be distracted by little people who don't mean anything. Like they thought they were helping Jesus be focused and continuing with his mission. Jesus didn't have time for blind beggars. He had an oppressive empire to destroy. But Jesus surprises us and catches us off guard. Nothing Jesus does is ever how we expect it to happen. He shows this is Jesus. This is how Jesus topples empires. By bending over and serving the cast aside and the dirty and the left out. This is how Jesus brings corrupt systems down to their knees by going to people who have been rejected and hurt and abused and bringing healing to them. Over and over in the Gospels, you see Jesus going beyond barriers and loving people back into wholeness. There's that, in John chapter four, there's the Samaritan woman at the well. She's had five ex-husbands and the dude she's living with now, not her husband. 
And she has one conversation with Jesus. Jesus tells her, I can give you water that if you drink from, you'll never be thirsty again. She falls in love with Jesus. She leads her entire town of Samaria into becoming followers of Jesus. This rejected, cast-aside woman, Jesus goes beyond those barriers and brings her back into wholeness. There's a woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8, and they bring her to him, and they throw her to his feet, and they say, Jesus, the law says that we got to stone this woman because she was caught in adultery. And Jesus says, he who is without sin can cast the first stone. He advocates for her and steps in front of her and becomes somebody who can love her back into wholeness. Every single time you see Jesus in the gospels, and there's several times where he bends over and he touches someone with leprosy, not just talks to them, but touches them and restores dignity and humanity back to them. He is crossing a barrier to love them back into wholeness. My favorite writer, Henry Nouwen, He says it this way, for Jesus, there are no countries to be conquered, no ideologies to be imposed, no people to be dominated. There are only men and women and children to be loved. Church, whenever we get caught up in culture wars, we forget this. Jesus never asked us to legislate morality He never asked us to reject or shame people because they sin differently than us. Jesus asked us to love radically with no footnotes or fine prints to read. And this brings us to our last point. Christ is calling his church to go from barrier builders to barrier removers. Guys, I don't know about you, but navigating church can be pretty um, discouraging sometimes. And it's been brought up a few times about scandal after scandal and abuse and cover-ups. And, but not just in this last week, but people are messy. And church is messy and it can be discouraging. But Jesus is so faithful and he loves us so much. And what he calls us to, he empowers us for. And so if he's called us to be this communal expression of Christ on the earth, if he's called us to be people who, when people come to our congregations and our churches and they they see us and experience us, he's called us to be the communal version of him on the earth. I believe in the coming years, the church has some very difficult days ahead of her. And I don't mean to sound alarmist, and I'm not saying like that we're going to be like persecuted or thrown in internment camps or anything like that. But I am saying that the backlash of a lot of our scandals is going to catch up to us. And even though none of us in this room had anything to do with what happens with the Southern Baptist Convention or Hillsong or Mars Hill or what have you, people are going to look at these scandals and they're going to project them on us. And you know what? Part of me is okay with that. Because the church has never been good at stewarding worldly power. Every time we get worldly power, we manage to make a bigger mess of things. Church history shows time and time again that the church thrives most on the margins. I don't think the great work of the church lies in trying to influence lawyers in D.C. It doesn't lie in angry social media posts or being duped by talking heads on cable news. The great work of the church lies where it has always lied. And that is us doing the work that Jesus has called us to do. And for now, I think that means identifying and removing barriers between people and Jesus. Not just LGBTQ people, everybody in Jesus. So if you're here and you've caught a vision for a Jesus who is big enough for all of our messy stories, not just the ones we're comfortable with, I want to challenge you to proactively seek and find what are the things in, not just in your family, but Pastor Tom says you guys have a really cool small group ministry here. What about in your small group or in your church as a whole? What are the barriers that you see that could stand in the way between somebody, some LGBTQ person who has the courage to come into church after all the history that's happened that might make them come in and might make them feel pretty hurt or abused, or ashamed, or rejected? What are the words that you use, or the the way that you talk about people, or the way that you stare at people, or the way that you other people, or not just you specifically, but like anybody in the church? Like, how can we identify these barriers and remove them so that it can be easier for people to come to Jesus? And also, I want to say, most of the time, 
if somebody in the gay community comes into church, they're not expecting the entire church to change all of their beliefs on account of them. Most of the time, if somebody comes into church, they're pretty aware of how the church feels about like their stance on gay marriage. But if they're coming in, it's because they're longing for something deep and meaningful. They want to feel like they belong and that they can receive connection and they can receive love and they can receive embrace from people. If they're coming to church, it's because there's something inside of them that knows they need Jesus. So let's get really good at making it easy for them. I started the story by talking about me being 16 years old and sitting on my bed with my dad's revolver in my hand and trying to build the courage to pull the trigger. I sat there for a couple hours um, and I get a phone call like two or three in the morning. And I'm like, what the heck? Why is, and I look and it was a friend of mine and this friend had been in California visiting his little brother. And he was a student leader in our church and um, just a great guy. And so I answered because I saw he's calling me at 2 a.m. Like nothing good is happening at 2 a.m. And so I'm like, hey dude, what's up? And, um, and he says, Tony, like I, I don't, I was just playing video games with my brother and I, I just started thinking about you and my heart just started getting really, really heavy. And I started getting really sad and I didn't know what was going on. And my dad told me that maybe that meant that we were supposed to pray for you. And so I went outside and I started praying for you and I just started crying. And so I just knew that I needed to call you. And I, I, I can't explain it, Tony, but I just knew that I needed to call you and just tell you that God loves you and he sees you. And he told me to open up my Bible to Psalm 5. And in Psalm 5, it talks about how David, the Lord says to David that God counts all of your sighs and all of your tears. That all of this pain that I had been experiencing up to this point, the Lord had seen. And so I told my friend, thank you. I didn't tell him what I was thinking about doing. I told him later. I hung up the phone and I got up and I went into uh, the kitchen to get a glass of water, trying to process what just happened. And as I walk into the kitchen on my parents' dining room uh, mantle, there was this crystal cross and the, the porch light and the moon were shining through the cross and in just such a specific way that it looked kind of sparkly and luminescent and really pretty and not all that much different than this little rainbow thing over here. And I remember seeing that. And if you've heard God talk to you before, very rarely is it like the audible voice of God saying something to you. It's more like something is imprinted into your mind and in your heart. And I just felt like God said to me, because of what I did on this cross, nothing stands between you and me but love. Your desires do not condemn you. And I think there are people here who need to hear that. Your desires do not condemn you. And I fell to my knees and I wept and I just said, all right, Jesus. And, and he said, if you follow me, I promise you that I'm gonna give you a life that is thrilling and fulfilling. And I committed my life to Jesus. And there's been so much not great stuff that has happened between the, now and then. But he has been faithful to his promise. I wanna say, everybody in this room, whether you're queer or not, whether you... <laughs> feel like total, like you belong or you feel like an outcast, like that there is a cross that says to you that nothing stands between you and your creator but his love for you. And if you're here and you're the type of person that if, if you have this thought where you think, yeah, he says that, but if he really knew, like if he got on my search history on my phone, if he knew I was spending my money, if he knew the loans that I took out without telling my spouse, if he knew how I handle myself at work or with my friends, if he knew that I was the dude who does the Tinder hookups nonstop, like he wouldn't be saying that. I'm saying that to you. Your desires do not condemn you and nothing stands between you and your creator but love. I believe the spirit is at work and I believe God wants to bring radical restoration to an entire demographic of people who previously thought 
that there's no place for them in the church. And I believe that as the church is in this cultural moment where it's in a state of crisis, I actually believe that the better we get at including and embracing people who are different than us, without compromising what we know to be true in scripture, the better we get in that, the more the embers of revival get stoked. And the more life and love and Holy Spirit power you're gonna see breathed into the church. God is gonna do something great and he's not gonna do it by changing what has been true for 2,000 years about marriage and sex. But he's gonna do it through the radical restoration and renovation of hearts. And he has chosen the church of today for such a moment as this. So Lord, we ask you to guide us and lead us in love. I just feel like right now, I didn't ask Pastor Tom for permission to do this. Um, Go ahead and keep your eyes closed, but I feel like there are people in this room who need to repent of homophobia and mistreatment of LGBTQ people who have made the jokes or made the slurs or made the comments or have been people who have felt like they have made church an unsafe place, not just church, but maybe home or work or what have you. And you're listening to this and you're like, gosh, I wasn't meaning to be hateful. I wasn't meaning to be spiteful, but I'm listening to this. I'm seeing how I could have come across that way and I need to repent of that. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? And I could just pray with you. See one, two, three. There is no shame for those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you're here today, and there's one more group, and maybe you identify with the LGBTQ community or you don't, but you feel like that blind beggar a lot of the times, and you feel like you've the message you've heard is that Jesus is not for you. And you want to just know that Jesus sees you and wants to love you and restore you. I'm not asking you to like convert if you're not already a Christian. I'm asking you if you just want, if you identify with that and you want to just receive prayer that you'd feel seen and known by your creator and you feel like that blind beggar, would you raise your hand? all over the room. So Jesus, we come to you with our repentance and our vulnerability. Lord, for those of us who have the courage and the self-awareness to say that I often have been part of the problem when it comes to whether or not people who wrestle with their sexuality or their gender, maybe they don't even wrestle with it, they've just fully embraced it, but I'm part of the reason that when they come to church, they feel unsafe. Lord, I ask that their repentance would lead to renewal. God, I ask that their repentance would lead them to a place not of shame, but of open, widespread embrace. And God, for the people here who raised their hands and said, I feel like that blind beggar. I feel like I've been told this Jesus isn't for me, that I need to shut up and sit down and know my place. God, I ask that right now they would sense the God of the universe who stoops down and gets on our level and touches us and dignifies us and fills us with your mercy and your grace. And we receive this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you are inspired by this message, make sure you subscribe to our podcast, leave us a review, and share it with your friends. We hope you'll tune in again soon.